Hey, welcome to 49cc Scoot. My name's Brent. I've been doing a lot of work to my T-Max recently, and today I'm gonna to show you the performance modifications that I've done with acceleration testing along the way, so you'll be able to see exactly how much difference they made. Before I started with the performance mods, I had to make a correction. I did a huge maintenance service to the T-Max not too long ago, and while I was at it, I decided to replace the clutch plates and springs. I had around 28,000 miles on the bike at the time, and I was advised that sometimes clutches have started to slip as early as roughly 30,000 miles. I don't think that's common, and the clutch is more likely to last quite a bit longer, but I had other reasons to work on the clutch as well. I've never been happy with how the T-Max accelerates from a stop. Even with lighter weights in the stock variator, RPM stays very low until 25 to 30 miles per hour, so it doesn't take off very quickly. I installed a Melosi clutch kit and replaced the clutch springs with the stiffest springs from Melosi that are designated for racing use. I was a little worried at the time that the stiff springs would be too aggressive for street use based on their description, but I thought they would get RPM up off the line and give me a nice boost in acceleration. Unfortunately, they didn't seem to do anything for me. The acceleration tests that I did were a tenth of a second slower across the board, but I had a theory to explain why. RPM was essentially the same before and after the clutch part swaps, so that shouldn't really change anything, but I also did some mild port work to the cylinder head and intakes during my big T-Max service, and I never tested the clutch or porting individually because the bike was apart until everything was finished. I also did 50 to 80 mile per hour acceleration tests, and I found that it improved by 7 tenths of a second there, which is a pretty substantial change. RPM is higher during the 50 to 80 mile per hour tests than 0 to 60s, so I assume that the porting was helping at higher RPM, but hurting at lower RPM. Things got a little more complicated after I posted a detailed clutch service video, and someone realized that I installed a collar and a washer in the reverse order. I had what I looked at as a foolproof plan to easily ensure that all of the clutch parts went back in as they came out. I laid everything out in the order that it was removed, and then went down the line during reassembly. It had to be right doing it that way, and I trusted that more than the service manual's diagram after it was also pointed out that Yamaha's diagram shows one plate facing the wrong way. The only problem is, as far as I can tell, the parts came out of my clutch that way to begin with, or they flipped over when they came out. This is the only video that I have of it, and I can't tell for sure. By the time I knew about it, I had already done test rides, and I had even taken the bike on a 300 mile ride doing everything from in town to interstate without noticing any issues. Still, it worried me that I could have some sort of damage, or at least the incorrect order could be why the clutch didn't work any better even with the stiff springs. Even more importantly to me, I had taken the video down for the clutch service to prevent anyone else from putting the spacers in the wrong way, so I wanted to get a corrected version up. I drained the oil first and removed the filter and checked both for metal debris. I didn't find anything, so that was a good sign. Then I proceeded to remove the clutch and check it. I was both surprised and relieved to see that the clutch parts and the shaft that it rides on were all fine. I guess I got lucky. I put everything back in the correct order. I couldn't tell any difference from riding, but I did acceleration tests to find out for sure, and they averaged out just like before, aside from 60 mile per hour times being a tenth slower which could be from wind or maybe aerodynamic effects from the lack of some fairing since I didn't reassemble everything. By this time I had a draggy performance meter and it's a more accurate way to measure so I used it for before and after checks as well. There is some difference in the results but I would call it negligible, especially if you look at the eighth mile and the quarter mile info. What it all boils down to is that performance didn't significantly change regardless of the orientation of the washer and the collar. Obviously you want those in there the right way, but swapping them didn't suddenly make my Melosi clutch springs work any better and I could move on to installing more go fast parts knowing that I had an accurate baseline. An aftermarket variator is the only modification that I actually planned on doing from the beginning of this process. 
I had heard that a good variator could make a drastic improvement in the T-Max and watched videos from multiple users showing much better acceleration and RPM control. For something that currently costs under $200, I had to try a Melosi Multivare. There are other variators for the T-Max, but I've been very happy with Melosi variators on other scooters and ScooterTuning.ca had them in stock. ScooterTuning.ca gives me a discount on parts to make projects like this one possible and they carry a lot of go fast and replacement parts for all sorts of scooters. Their shipping speeds and customer service are top notch, so check them out and help a business that supports the scooter community while getting yourself a great deal. I'm not going to give you a whole detailed variator installation guide here because the process is mostly the same as servicing a stock variator and I've already got a detailed CVT inspection and maintenance video up, so check the description for a link to that and I'll just give you a brief look at the process here so you know what to expect if you want to do a variator swap and I'll cover the details relevant to the multi-pair. A few body panels on the left side have to be removed so you can get to the CVT cover. I've got videos covering panel removal and installation in great detail linked in the description as well. Then a couple of outer covers and a filter are removed before taking off the CVT cover. The rear pulley has two spots for M6 bolts to thread in and push the pulley apart to relieve tension from the belt. You should have one specialty tool for this process, which is a variator holding tool. You can buy one or just check my CVT service video for info on making your own. I'm sure you could just use an impact wrench to remove and install the variator nut, but I would suggest getting the tool so you can use a torque wrench for installation to proper spec. Once the nut is off, the collar and the variator assembly can be removed. If you haven't serviced the CVT very recently, I would suggest checking the rear pulley and belt while you're at it. Comparing them side by side, the Melosi Variator is about 3 mm larger in diameter, which could potentially provide more belt travel for high speed if the belt is long enough to use it. The Melosi Variator is 3 ounces or 85 grams lighter. The ramps have different angles and extend further toward the edge in the Melosi, which should change how the Variator works and extend its range. Both drive bosses are the same length, but Melosi includes two half millimeter thick shims that can be added to make the drive boss effectively one millimeter longer. In general, a shorter drive boss can help with lowering RPM and improving belt travel for higher speeds, while a longer boss can allow the belt to travel further down in the front pulley and therefore a little further out in the rear pulley, which can improve takeoff. If the boss is too long, the belt may have a lot of side to side play and that can cause slip or RPM may increase too much. Sometimes you may use more shims with a brand new belt that is full width and then remove the shims as the belt wears to maintain the same performance. So for example, if you add 2.5 millimeter shims and it works great for you, then you check later and you find that your belt has worn a half millimeter, you take one of the half millimeter shims out. Melosi provides their own grease, but I chose to use Bellray assembly lube, which is what I've always used in the T-Max CVT. Lubricating the multivare is just like lubricating the stock variator. Be careful not to get any grease outside of sealed areas and do clean up with rags and rubbing alcohol as needed. Melosi does provide this little button though that makes installing the drive boss easier with less risk of damaging a seal. Melosi includes two sets of 25 by 15 millimeter roller weights with a variator kit which are 16 and 18 grams. I never use roller weights in any of my scooters and I didn't intend to start here. I use sliding weights or sliders because sometimes they will provide a performance benefit, but they have outlasted rollers in all of my small scooters and seem to be doing well in the T-Max's stock variator. I think they're currently around $50 per set, so it does increase the cost of the variator upgrade and I can't speak for the longevity of the weights included. Sometimes sliders work a little bit different than rollers, and sometimes they work at the same RPM. But I chose to apply Melosi's roller info and hope that it worked out about the same. They say to use 18 gram weights for touring, a mix of 18 and 16 gram weights to work like 17 gram for sport, and 16 gram for racing or with a modified exhaust. I didn't have a modified exhaust, but I wanted to see what the racing setting was all about, so I started with a 16 gram setting. For me, that meant placing one 17 gram slider then 15 gram beside it and continuing that pattern for equal weight distribution all the way around the variator. 
I installed the bushings that Melosi supplied on the stock ramp plate since Melosi doesn't include a ramp plate with their kit. Installing the variator from here is just like installing a stock variator, aside from deciding whether or not to use drive boss shims. I did a couple of mock-up assemblies to see how the belt sat with and without the shims and check spline engagement. This is what I'd call excellent spline engagement with no shims installed. The spline section of the shaft sits near the outer edge of the ramp plate, but does not protrude. This allows more contact area between the ramp plate and the shaft and leaves no spline sticking out to prevent proper tightening. With both shims installed, the shaft loses about a millimeter worth of engagement area. Too little could lead to accelerated wear or damage, but it appeared to be acceptable to me, so I used both shims to provide the most belt travel on the low end for a strong takeoff. I torqued everything to Yamaha specs during installation. I put the side panel on that includes the footrest and didn't bother with the other panels. This makes it easier if I want to try different weights or shims, and I was also planning some other work like wiring and a couple of appearance mods at the time. Just make sure you have all safety equipment installed when testing. The first thing I noticed was how much RPM it took to move. This is almost exactly what I was expecting to happen when I made the swap to racing clutch brakes. RPM stayed up at low speeds, but once it got up to about 40 miles per hour, it matched the cruise RPM recorded with 16 gram weights in the stock variant. The main difference when moving was that it felt more responsive and pulled harder with any throttle twisting because RPM was jumping up into or at least closer to the power band from any speed. Then I did some acceleration tests from a stop, and that's when I started to love the new variant. Now it's not the fastest thing ever for sure, but it starts pulling hard right away. I was genuinely surprised the first time I tried it. I thought it would feel a little bit better, but it went from waiting for it to go to making sure I was holding on before I hit the gas. It felt better overall, but the biggest improvement seemed like it was from 0 to 60. I averaged out results from multiple test runs, and again I was surprised at how much difference the Multivera made. No matter which spec you look at, there's a dramatic improvement. Aside from 60 foot times, it's one to two seconds quicker across the board. Speed doesn't improve much, which aligns with my initial reaction that it was way better off the line, but not doing much more past roughly 60 miles per hour. I graphed out speed versus RPM before and after to show us why. Peak torque should be around 6,500 RPM, and peak horsepower should be at around 7,500 RPM. So there's roughly a thousand RPM range that we'd really like to stay in for the best performance during wide open throttle acceleration. At launch, the stock variator is well below peak while the Melosi is at least close. The stock variator never reached the power band until 70 miles per hour, while the Melosi stayed there all the way from 30 miles per hour to the end of a quarter mile run. Then from 65 miles per hour and up, the two weren't very far apart. So now we can clearly see why it runs so much stronger than before off the line and then only a little better toward the end of a run. Since RPM was staying toward the low side of the power band, I wanted to try lighter weights and see if acceleration improved even more. I pulled it back apart and swapped the 17 gram weights out so I was using all 15 gram sliders. felt even better with the lighter weights and acceleration data agreed, showing roughly one or two tenths of a second improvement across the board. I reached the point where the speedometer could no longer keep up on takeoff, so I couldn't map out the whole range, 
but it looks like the 15 gram sliders were working about 500 RPM higher until the top end where the gap narrowed to roughly a 250 RPM difference. Cruise RPM also increased by 250 to 500 over what I saw with the 16 gram weights, and it would probably be wiser to use something heavier for a bike that gets used regularly, but I wanted to be as quick as I could with what I had. I did consider ordering 14 gram sliders to try, but I didn't want to spend another 50 bucks or so, and I didn't want to push cruise RPM up anymore. I was very happy with the gains that I got from the Variator at this point, but there was one thing bothering me. The Melosi manual mentioned lighter weights working best with a modified exhaust. So what, right? It was working great as tuned with my stock exhaust. But that little note made me wonder if Melosi was finding any significant gains with aftermarket pipes, or if it was just a sales pitch for their exhaust. Now I've said from day one that I didn't see any reason to spend the money on an aftermarket pipe for the T-Max. They can be very expensive, commonly ranging from around $600 to over $1,000, unless you buy a generic Chinese pipe, and generally motorcycle exhausts don't add that much power. It's also common for aftermarket exhausts to save a little bit of weight, but I'm a 300 pound rider on a nearly 500 pound scooter, so even with many claiming around 10 pounds of reduction, that wasn't really a big selling point for me. Of course, the noise is one of the biggest reasons that many people buy pipes, but even though I love engines and the noises that they make, it didn't matter a whole lot to me, and again, not enough to make it worth that much money. I just couldn't stop wondering, what if an exhaust would make a noticeable difference in performance though? I mean, I do have some mild port work, and RPM does stay pretty high when on the throttle now, so maybe I could gain something with a new pipe. My best single run, not average, was 15.27 seconds in the quarter mile, which really made me want to see a 14 second run. This is the problem with modifying things. You go a little faster, and then you want to go a little faster than that, and then a little faster than that, and the next thing you know, you're broke and so are all of your bikes. I told myself that I'd just search a couple of classifieds and check eBay to see if there were any amazing deals, figuring that not many people have T-Max 500s in the US, so it's very unlikely that I'd find anything but high-priced new parts, and then I could go on with life knowing that at least I tried. Well, that didn't work out as planned. Someone happened to be selling this new inbox Yoshimura R77 exhaust on eBay for $400 or best offer. I made an offer and got it for $375 shipped, and here we are. Installation was pretty simple, but I've got a detailed install vid linked in the description if you want to check that out. Basically, you unbolt the stock exhaust and hanger, swap the oxygen sensor out from the old pipe to the new one, and then bolt on Yoshimura's hanger and pipe. The pipe comes with a noise reducing insert, but I like the sound the best without it because it sounded deeper and more full. I did later test performance with and without the insert, but there wasn't much difference either way. I have to admit that the loud pipe did make it more fun to ride. I smiled a lot on the first rides, and I chuckled as it popped during deceleration. My only complaint about the riding experience is that it is pretty loud on the bike. I actually started wearing earplugs because my hearing was dull or ringing after anything more than a very short ride. The pipe is also a great appearance mod in my opinion. Now the important part, acceleration testing. It actually slowed down by a couple of tenths, plus or minus a little here or there. And this was after going back up to 16 gram sliders after seeing better results with those. I don't think the exhaust liked lower RPM, but rather it seemed that the CBT was wearing or settling in and operating a little differently than it did at first in RPM rows. Going slower was pretty disappointing, but I wondered if the air fuel mixture was on the lean side with a new pipe and not letting it perform at its best. There were some side effects after the exhaust install that supported this theory, like popping on deceleration. The 
T-Max has always popped on diesel in stock form, but not as bad as it does with a new pipe. It also stumbled or ran rough in certain conditions, and it did not do that before the exhaust. The worst was low throttle at low cruise speeds or around 10. I spent some time looking around at a few products and decided to buy a Melosi Forcemaster 2 fuel controller. There are other products out there, but Melosi is the only one to include a pre-made tune for an aftermarket exhaust and air filter, and I was trying to get something to plug and play with no or minimal adjustment required. They say the tune that I wanted to use is for Melosi's own exhaust, but I figured it should be close enough for most aftermarket pipes. I was using a stock air filter, so I picked up Melosi's filter as well to try to better match their pre-made tune. I installed the air filter first, and this was very quick since I already had body panels off in front of the filter access. I would normally test each part after installation to find out exactly what worked and what didn't, but in this case I decided to install the fuel controller as well, so I wasn't riding around even more lean than I already was. I've got a how-to for the fuel controller up and linked in the description, but basically installation involves running wires and making connections to the throttle position sensor, fuel injectors, ignition coil, and a frame ground. You have to go through a simple calibration process to get it working with the TPS, and then a tune can be selected with a map style. The other tunes are all for big bore and cammed engines, so the map for the stock engine with exhaust and filter is the only one relevant to me. The Force Master also has three dials that can add or subtract 20% to the fuel curve in low, mid, or high RPM areas. I set those all to zero to use Melosi's curve without modification. I noticed much less popping on deceleration, in fact, even less than when it was stopped. It didn't stumble or run rough at certain points like it did before the controller either, so getting rid of drivability issues after the exhaust was made simple. I did some acceleration testing that initially went poorly. Everything felt good, but my times were the same as before or a little slower, and I noticed that I had low satellite errors on many of my drag gear results. I ended up mounting the draggy on the top of the scoot near the gauges to be sure that it got a good signal. And I also set up a wideband to monitor air fuel ratio and see what was happening and if I could improve the tune beyond factory settings for wide open throttle performance. I briefly contemplated removing the exhaust to weld in a second oxygen sensor bung so I could retain the stock sensor and add the wideband there, but I didn't really want to go to that much trouble and I wasn't sure that there was any point since my main concern was wide open throttle where the scoot was not likely to pay any attention to the stock O2 anyway. To be honest, I didn't know if it relied on the Force Master 2's fuel tables at all times, or if it gathered info from the oxygen sensor at all, so I decided to try it the easy way first and remove the stock sensor to give me a spot for the wideband. Then I came up with a quick mounting solution on the bar where I mount my GPS. It's not pretty, but I only wanted to use the wideband temporarily. I used an old battery under the seat as a power supply, that way I wouldn't have to modify any wiring on the scooter. And then I ran the wires for everything to the gauge, leaving plenty of slack so handlebar movement wouldn't be an issue. There are much better ways to route wires, but my sole concerns were that everything would operate safely and be easy to remove. I started out with all of the fuel adjustment dials on the Force Master Zero and found that it was running at about 12.5 to 1 air fuel ratio during wide open throttle acceleration. When I checked my times, it looked like the fuel controller was not only restoring lost performance from when the exhaust was throwing off the tune, but improving elapsed time and speed. Without testing the air filter alone, I can't say how much of a role that played, but clearly the combination was working well, and I was really close to breaking into the 14 second range. I suspected that performance may improve if I could lean it out to around 13 to 1 at wide open throttle. So I turned the high dial to roughly 11 o'clock and did more test runs. That moved the air fuel ratio to about 12.8 to 1 when full throttle. 
not only did I get my 14 second pass, but the average was 14.98 with the highest speeds that I've seen with any tester. I moved the high dial just a little more to about the 1030 position and that put the air fuel ratio pretty much right on 13 to 1. That slowed it down. Not much at all, but both averaged and individual times seemed to be telling me that I was now moving too far toward lean. Maybe I could spend more time trying to tweak the dial to get just the right ratio and squeeze a little more out of it, but I was very happy with the results from a 12.8 to 1 ratio, so I set the dial back to where it was and left it there. I tried one more time to make sure the air fuel ratio was where I wanted it, and I got the best time that I've seen. For a long time, the T-Max was the king of scooters. You may even be able to argue that in some respects it still is, but there are bigger and better scoots around today. A lot of scooter nerds like me looked at them as sort of a dream scooter. I can't tell you how disappointing it was when I finally got a T-Max 500 and twisted the throttle wide open, only to feel it roll out at a leisurely pace. I've enjoyed owning my T-Max very much and think it's a great all-around bike that can go on any road and handle surprisingly well. I would have never expected this essentially 500 pound scooter to be so easy to ride at parking lot speeds and so much fun for twisty roads. The only thing that it lacked was power or acceleration. I'm well aware that my T-Max is still not fast for a motorcycle, but it finally feels like what I expected when I bought it. Sure, I'd still like to have way more than the quoted 40 to 45 horsepower. If you want a bike to pull hard at higher speeds, it's going to need horsepower. That said, to go from over 17 seconds in the quarter mile and basically 10 seconds 0 to 60s in stock form to under 15 seconds in the quarter and just over 6 seconds 0 to 60s is a huge difference, especially when you realize that I did this for a total of about $1,000. Good luck getting most motorcycles or cars to change that much for that amount of money. This is more similar to the transformation that you get with a big bore kit on a small scooter which is almost unparalleled in all other types of vehicles and one of the biggest reasons that I love working on scooters so much. I haven't done much fuel economy testing because I've been enjoying it way too much to get good mileage out of it. I did ride easy for one tank of fuel and I got 47.2 miles per gallon, which is about as good as I usually got before these mods. It does seem to be burning more fuel when I'm riding harder, with miles per gallon dipping into the high or even mid 30s, but I was seeing tanks in the high 30 mile per gallon range before the recent work. If you're looking for advice on modifying your T-Max, I would say the Variator is well worth it. Most of the gains that I got were from the Variator and weights, and the cost versus improvement ratio is amazing. The only thing that I don't know yet is how well it holds up over time. I've heard that belts won't last as long, or even the Variator may not wear as well as stock, but as long as wear is not greatly increased, it's likely to still be worth the change if you want more performance. I'm not sure that I'd recommend the exhaust, air filter, and fuel controller to everyone. Combined, they did knock off a half second or so in the quarter mile, but the value is not nearly the same as what the Variator provides. At regular price, an exhaust, filter, and fuel controller will probably cost around $1,000 to $1,500 currently, depending on the exact parts if you're buying new. For $200 to maybe $250 with sliders, the Variator shaved my quarter mile times by a second and a half compared to lightweights in a stock Variator. I'd try the Variator first, and if bitten by the performance bug, then consider the other mods as a group. Exhaust alone slowed me down and caused drivability issues, so leave room in your budget for a fuel controller and filter if you decide to go that route. There are also aftermarket camshafts, forged pistons, big bore kits, and other mods, but those will require much more installation time and skill and a full 560cc cam setup with all of the toppings will be very expensive. I hope this video has been helpful and entertaining, and if it has, please hit the like button and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.